Thank you for the honour of delivering the Lutsky Lecture. I had imagined I'd be spending three days in the spring in Cambridge, but the reality in Manchester is rather different. Um, this lecture, of course, is in honour of Jim Lutsky, and Jim Lutsky is the most amazing and productive clinician scientist who for decades has produced such high quality work that has changed the field. But I'm sure Jim would be the first person to acknowledge the importance of the environment in which he works. Jim works at Baylor College of Medicine, although he's had sabbaticals in Cambridge and a number of other places. And Jim will acknowledge the importance of the big team and the contributions they make both in scientific and organizational infrastructure to enable his research to make progress. I draw attention to Art Baudet and Brendan Lee, who are both, have, Art was the chairman and Brendan now is, and before Art, it was Tom Caskey, and many other colleagues such as David Nelson and Pavel and Richard Gibbs, as well as the clinicians who are top class in their own right. But I'm sure Jim would also want to pay tribute to Frank Greenberg, who I knew and met at many, many meetings. And Frank died prematurely, but he contributed huge amounts to identifying and being really precise in the delineation of new syndromes. So all Frank and I, Frank and I were contemporaries at one stage. And so I'm going to try and describe the situation as it was when syndromes were beginning to be described in detail. And I want to make the point that rare disease research begins often with a single patient. This is a report in the first volume of the American Journal of Medical Genetics. It was a new journal and Albert Schintzel, Andreas Gideon described two siblings, one male, one female, with a combination of disorders, skeletal and other disorders. And as a new um, resident in genetics, uh, one of the first patients I ever saw was this patient who had this syndrome that's now being called Schintzel Gideon syndrome. And we described the single patient. And although it had been suggested that it may be recessive since two siblings were affected, we were quite cautious about that since we said there was no parental consanguinity. So we had to be cautious. Now, just to amuse those of you who weren't born in 1979, this was an era when we had no computers, no faxes, no copiers. We either had to type our own manuscripts or persuade a secretary to do so. And if you wanted a copy, it had to be a carbon paper copy. Library journals were very limited. And if you wanted another journal that your library didn't stock, you had to ask to be for an interlibrary loan, which took three weeks to arrive and cost quite a lot of money. When you wrote a paper, as well as a typewriter and carbon paper copies, if you wanted any illustrations, you had to get glossy prints from medical illustration. And in a service setting, there was no possibility of DNA extraction or storage. All one could do was x-rays and fairly rudimentary chromosome analysis. So it's not surprising that um, progress was slow, but eventually when exome sequencing was first used as a research tool by very forward looking groups like Nijmegen that had with great foresight put together um, cohorts of patients with rare diseases with unknown cause that results came pouring out and indeed this group in Nijmegen found that Schintzel Gideon syndrome was due to mutations within a certain part of the gene, gain of function mutations, 
um, in the gene called set BP1. There's a separate syndrome with loss of function, and which is a story that we're seeing with many other genes. Another rare syndrome that I thought I'd mention was one I was very involved with first describing. This is in 1991 when Sam was born. Sam had a diaphragmatic hernia or exomphalos, absent corpus callosum, and high myopia, hence the glasses, and sensory neural deafness. I presented his case at a UK dysmorphology club meeting and Maggie Barrow in the audience said she had a patient exactly the same. And by then, um, both sets of parents, Sam's parents and this child's parents had had a further affected child detected in utero um, and they had requested termination. And then I had one further patient whose parents were consanguineous. So that was fairly convincing evidence that this was an autosomal recessive disorder. And we published this in the American Journal of Medical Genetics, which by then was in its 47th um, volume. And again, it, it being a rare disorder, one had to make international collaborations and link up with people who had the technology to look into this further. And we did this with Barbara Pober and colleagues in Harvard. And eventually in 2007, we found mutations in a gene called LRP2, which encodes megalin, which is an endocytic receptor. And quite a lot was known about this because um, there had been research groups investigating mice um, which uh, were knockouts for this particular gene. And it was known that the lack of this receptor affects renal protein resorption. And so we went straight back to the patients and tested them. And in fact, every single patient with this syndrome, which is now being called Donai Barrow syndrome, has had low molecular weight proteinuria. And indeed our original patient, Sam, you may or may not be able to see his photograph on this slide. Um, he was found to have quite severe renal disease and he died in his early 20s um, of renal failure. Single patients also kick off other interests and these, this particular child, um, I saw and she fitted what had been described as hypermelanosis of Ito, which was thought to be a dominant disorder. But to my mind, her feet looked very much like feet that I'd seen in triploid fetuses. And she had these stripy markings on her legs and around her trunk. So we did the skin biopsy and we found that indeed she was a diploid triploid mosaic. We found another patient and we published this but not everyone with this combination has diploid triploid mosaicism. And so we felt that skin markings, uh, patients with skin markings in what are called Blaschko's lines, it was a non-specific manifestation of mosaicism. And the actual markings represent the migratory roots of neural crest cells as they migrate circumferentially round the trunk, they're following the dorsal route and they, and as they migrate in a linear fashion down the legs. Now this then led us to an interest in another disorder which is inherited. And this is an X-linked dominant disorder with male lethality called incontinentia pigmenti. And the girls are effective functional mosaics because of X inactivation. And the girls have these unusual skin markings. And we uh, linked in with Sue Kenrick and we did some very laborious linkage studies creeping ever closer to the gene, which was the way things were done then. But actually it was observations in a single patient, an atypical patient who turned to have turned out to have a different type of mutation where eventually pointed this international collaboration between France, the UK and the United States to come to find that this disorder was due to a recurrent deletion mutation um, in a gene called NEMO.
and of the there are so many disorders that we always suspected were going to be mosaics because of their patchy manifestations on the skin and this indeed has turned out to be the case many different groups have investigated these but i draw attention to this particular group <coughs> of disorders pik 3ca um, mutations etc um, because later in this conference is going to be a talk by Guillaume Cano from Paris about amazing treatment of patients that have these awful disorders. Um, so I look forward to seeing that. Rare diseases, of course, and patient stories are also extremely important um, for teaching. And in fact, Andrew Reed and I have co-authored a textbook, um, which is fourth edition has just been published and the danger of blatant commercialization, I would say that there is a special offer on the ebook for conference delegates about this. Um, but the importance is that you can teach the whole of genetics through patient stories um, where you follow patients through. And we've found that this is really popular for medical students in particular, for genetic counselors, um, because it brings it into their areas of interest and yet they learn genetics as they're going through. Now, dysmorphology used to be thought of more as a bit of an art and people who were good at pa pattern recognition were good at dysmorphology, et cetera. But it's not sufficient just to say things. And it's very difficult in words to write down what you see. So it's very important to think of ways of documenting dysmorphology. And you do this with photographs by using standardized terminology, with measurements and charts, but also with new imaging technologies. And Peter Hammond that you can see here developed dense surface model studies um, with whole groups of patients, including a big control group and then cohorts of patients with certain syndromes. And this was of great interest to us because we were interested and had studies going on for some time in Williams syndrome. Now, Williams syndrome, the cause of course, wasn't known until 1993. And the way it was discovered was that there was a family with dominant supravalvular aortic stenosis, which is the characteristic um, heart defect in Williams syndrome. This family didn't have Williams syndrome, but they had dominant SBAS. And they were found to have a 6-7 translocation that on chromosome 7 transected the elastin gene. And it wasn't a great leap of faith to think, could this region be involved in Williams syndrome? And indeed the same group reported very shortly after that, that there was a recurrent deletion in Williams syndrome. And so everyone with Williams syndrome was found to be deleted for the elastin gene, but for a bigger area, a 1.5 megabase region in that region on chromosome seven. And we tested all our 92 patients that we'd classified as typical, and all of them had exactly the same deletion or more or less the same deletion. And so this was satisfying because it meant our clinical skills were fine, but it wasn't very good because we'd hoped to work out which genes were involved in the different components of Williams syndrome. And all we'd really found out was that SVAS was linked to haploinsufficiency of the elastin gene. So it was a bit of a pity. We couldn't, by looking at more and more Williams patients, we didn't learn more and more. But what we had done is we'd also collected a big SBAS cohort. Kay Metcalf in Manchester was involved in these studies from a clinical point of view and May Tassabeji from um, a scientific point of view. And of our 136 patients with SVAS, we found mutations in the elastin gene, point mutations <coughs> in 50%. But again, that didn't get us that much further. But I remember my story 
is based on, you can learn a huge amount from one patient. In this SBS cohort, we had four atypical patients, and I'll tell you a little bit about them. These two brothers had an 80 KB deletion that took out the elastin gene and limb kinase one, which is the gene next to it. They were examined in detail and all they had was SVAS. They had no sign of the unusual cognitive profile that patients with Williams syndrome have, where there's a real discrepancy between their verbal and spatial abilities. It's called a Williams syndrome cognitive profile. But these two brothers had no evidence of that at all. And then we had another patient who was really important because she had 23 of the 28 genes in this region deleted. And all she had was SVAS, no abnormal cognitive profile. In fact, she had a high IQ and she was normal. So that was telling us that these were the genes that we should be interested in because this is the Williams syndrome typical deletion. And our fourth patient, this is this little girl here, did have some heart problems. She had some of the Williams syndrome facial features, but wasn't typical. And she had some learning problems. And her deletion was 1.1 megabases, and it encompassed this gene silin 2 but also this gene called GTF2IRD1. And this gene is one of a cluster of genes that encode transcription factors that are in this distal end of the Williams syndrome deletion. And they are known to modulate goosecoid, which is known to be involved in craniofacial development. So we decided, of course, to investigate this patient further. And we looked at her 3D facial profiling. This is the average at different ages of a cohort of Williams patients. This is the average at different ages of a control group. And our little girl, Hannah, fitted right there, just slightly into the Williams region, but not in the dead typical um, uh, uh, craniofacial configuration. May Tassabeji also generated some GTF2IRD1 mice that were null for that gene. And they were looked at with this, three, with this 3D imaging as well. And as well as being overall smaller than the wild type, sorry, go back, smaller than the wild type, they also had shorter and sometimes abnormal snouts um, showing that this gene is likely involved in craniofacial development. But of course, as the decades have passed, genomic medicine has changed enormously. And many patients now are looking towards exome or genome first. But I would still argue, and I'm sure everybody involved in DDD studies and other studies would say that deep phenotyping and reverse phenotyping, where you look at the patient in the context of the result you've got to get the maximum benefit and the maximum information. And through this way, many newly described syndromes have appeared in the literature. Um, the human phenotype ontology is used for descriptive purposes, but it's also really important to look at the natural history because if ever we're going to treat such patients, you need to know what the normal course is of a particular disorder. That is, you need to look at individual patients. And it's also really important, and this is what the DDD study did, and obviously <clears throat> the 100,000 Genome Project, is persuading big funders and politicians of the importance of studying and eventually hoping to treat rare diseases. And there's been a lot of political influence by patient groups and professionals. Um, Liam Donaldson was the Chief Medical Officer of England, and he, his last annual report was in 2009. And in it, there was a whole chapter um, talking about rare diseases. I like to claim a little bit of uh, influence here since I was his advisor for a number of years. <clears throat> 
And he drew attention to the fact that research income or research income for rare diseases is about a pound per affected person, whereas for cancer per affected person, the research spend is about 185 pounds. Now, this is gradually changing. And people are realizing that if you add up all rare diseases, they actually, as a group, become common. common. And this is where organizations like OrphanNet, based in Paris, have been really effective over many years in persuading the EU about the importance of rare diseases and the importance of each member state to develop a rare disease plan. And this is indeed what the UK did when it was still part of the EU, but encouragingly has produced an update to the implementation plan um, last year. The two patient organisations I'd really like to mention are Genetic Alliance UK, which incorporates Rare Disease UK and Syndromes Without a Name UK, and they've been very influential over many decades. And then Unique, which started as a patient organization, particularly for those with rare chromosome disorders, but where they have been absolutely marvelous in producing wonderful and informative and accessible booklets about these newly described rare disorders, which are important both for patients uh, and families, but also for clinicians looking after them. And this is why I think patient organizations should be regarded as an integral part of any team looking at rare diseases. And they, they are the ones that will influence pharma to consider developing treatment. They are the ones that affect policy. And they are the ones that often raise funds for initial studies. And indeed, our studies on Williams syndrome were first funded by the Williams Syndrome Foundation. Now I mentioned treatments and I'm just going to mention, finish with uh, a few examples of treatment of individual patients which have come through knowledge of their underlying genetic disorder. This is a family that was studied and researched by Dr. Sid Banker, one of my colleagues in Manchester. This is a three month old boy who had megaloblastic anemia and seizures but he's cerebral, he had cerebral folate deficiency and cerebellar atrophy there, but his serum B12 and folate were normal. So Sid undertook studies. He'd had a, this child had had, by the way, a brother who died, a sister who died with an identical phenotype. Anyway, we did some gene studies, which I'm not sure you can see in the corner, but it showed that this family, this boy, um, was uh, had two uh, mutations on each allele of his dihydrofolate reductase gene. And um, this was shown on a Western blot as well, and his parents were both carriers. And so this is where we did from a number of one treatment. And he was given 30 milligrams of daily oral folinic acid, which is available. And the seizures and his anemia responded dramatically to this. So this is a treatable disorder, if only you can diagnose it. And just because it's topical, I'm mentioning spinal muscular atrophy type one. This is a child I saw back in 1968 when I was first qualified as a doctor. This was the third child in a family to be affected with this disorder. And all one could do was support the child, support the family while the child died. But miraculously, people now have treatments for this disorder. And NICE, which is the regulatory body for approving drugs to be used in the NHS, have just approved this, this um, gene therapy, which is a single dose gene therapy called Zolgensma. And amazingly, each dose is 1.79 million pounds but apparently NICE have negotiated some sort of discount, which seems amazing. But when you think that the current treatment for this disorder is often to ventilate these babies, these babies have been on long-term ventilation in intensive care unit, which can add up to between a quarter and a half 
a million pounds a year. So it makes this drug cost not sound so bad. The last example I'm going to use of genes being used in acute medicine is a study undertaken by my colleague, Bill Newman, and a company called Gene Drive that have developed a technique for point of care genetic testing. And they are looking for a mitochondrial mutation, which if present, and if a newborn baby is given this antibiotic gentamicin, that baby will become profoundly and irreversibly deaf, with the only treatment being um, a cochlear implant, which per ear costs 20,000 pounds. But what <clears throat> this assay has the potential to do is to avoid worldwide 14,000 cases of hearing loss per year. And it can be done by nurses on the neonatal ward in a clinically relevant time scale. So the baby's born, decisions made to admit the baby to neonatal intensive care, routine swabs are taken and so an extra swab is taken for this um, point of care test the nurses have all been trained to do this test and within an hour they get the result and that anyway is about the time scale at which antibiotics would have been given anyway and what you can do is avoid gentamicin if the child has got this particular mutation. And out of the original study of 847 newborn babies, newborns admitted to neonatal intensive care, three were found to be positive and were given a different antibiotic. The actual testing was 85% successful and obviously work is going on to improve the success rate of that. So what I've tried to do in this talk is to talk how and mention many partnerships. I haven't mentioned all of these, but partnerships and teams are absolutely essential. And one is really working towards the day when you can manage individuals with rare diseases effectively, where treatments and trials are possible and clinical systems are set up to enable this. And many centers, including ours, are looking at trying to deliver these things through a rare disease center. And as I said at the beginning, rare disease research begins with a single patient and is ultimately for the benefit of individual patients. So I'd like to finish by thanking my colleagues in Manchester, um, particularly Andrew, Bill, Sid, Kay, and May, but also I put here some pictures of patients that I'll never forget. And these are patients, and that's in, these are patient pictures taken in their everyday life, just to show that there's far more to a patient with rare disease than just their appearance in a hospital for re research, et cetera. And all of these are patients that have made contributions in so many different ways. From this chap here who works in a charity shop and really enjoys it and is very popular, to this family here who've done so much for the dwarf community. And you see there at Buckingham Palace receiving their OBEs. So thank you very much. And again, um, the importance we're doing all of this for our patients and I look forward to the rest of this meeting.